tell you something really shocking today. Around the world, at least one woman in three will be beaten or raped by an intimate partner in her lifetime. That's almost 700 million women. Sounds incredible, doesn't it? You might even think that somebody made that figure up. But they didn't, and I know that because I helped collect those numbers, and I'm going to tell you the story of where they came from. I grew up in an activist household, and by the time I got to college, I was really fed up with studying. I felt like college was getting in the way of my education, and what I really wanted was to be out in the world making a difference. So in 1979, when the Sandinista Revolution overthrew a brutal dictatorship in Nicaragua, I dropped out of college in my senior year to be a part of it, and I never looked back. I stayed there for almost 20 years more, working first as a community health activist and then as a women's rights activist. It was an amazing time. We eradicated polio. We eradicated illiteracy we felt that we were making history. But after 10 years of Contra war, US trade embargo, and thousands of young people who died defending their beliefs, the Sandinistas were voted out of power in 1990. By that time, Nicaragua was my home, and I stayed on. I hadn't thought very much about domestic violence before that. The revolution had proclaimed equality between men and women, and women had made huge advances in education, in employment, in political participation. This is one of my favorite photos from the Sandinista period. It's kind of the Nicaraguan version of Supermom, caring for her family and defending the fatherland at the same time. But behind closed doors, something very different was going on. And I came to understand this when I visited a shelter for battered women in Managua. Hearing the stories of these women made me realize that domestic violence had to be a lot more common than I realized. I started working with a network of women activists who were campaigning to end violence against women. They had drafted a law to criminalize domestic violence and provide protection for survivors of violence. But when we presented it to the political parties to get their support, they pretty much laughed in our faces. They told us that nobody would pay attention to this law, that it would never pass, unless we got some hard numbers to show that domestic violence was really a problem in Nicaragua. Well, talking to the politicians got me thinking about going back to school, which had not even crossed my mind until then. In fact, I really barely graduated from college the first time around. The only reason I did get my degree in the end was that I'd promised my mother that I wouldn't get married or have children until I finished college. So, thank you, Mom. I know she was OK with the revolution thing, but it totally flipped her out to think that I wasn't going to finish college. So although being an epidemiologist was the last thing on my life plan, I think my rebellious genes won out then. And I thought, OK, they want numbers? We'll give them numbers. And I went back to school and made studying domestic violence the subject of my doctoral dissertation. So in Leon, Nicaragua, we carried out a survey and interviewed 500 women about their experiences with violence. And when we started out, we really had no idea whether women would even talk to us about something this sensitive. But we found out that women were actually eager and, and even grateful to be able to tell their stories to somebody who'd listened to them with empathy, without judging them. Many of them had never told anybody about the violence they were experiencing, and so it was a really emotional experience. We also knew it could be dangerous for women to talk to us, so we came up with different ways of keeping it a complete secret. So for example, if a husband came into the room while we were interviewing a woman and wanted to know what we were talking about, we would switch to a dummy questionnaire. And we'd start asking her about you know, immunizations and breastfeeding and other stuff until he got bored and left. 
And then we always made sure to give her referrals to medical care, counseling, legal support if she needed it, and information about her rights. The findings from the study were truly shocking. We found out that 52%, or one out of every two women, had experienced physical or sexual violence from a partner in her lifetime. And one out of every four women had experienced violence in the last 12 months. This was vastly more than we had expected. In fact, only 3,000 women had reported violence to the police in the year before this study. Whereas according to our statistics, to our calculations, it was really more like 250,000 women who had experienced violence. We presented our fi findings everywhere. We published in peer-reviewed scientific journals, but we also went all over the country talking to mayors, to health promoters, to community activists, to tell them what was going on with domestic violence in the country. And it caused a huge wave of indignation throughout the country. In addition to the numbers, we told the story of a woman we called Anna Cristina, um, whose story became the title of our, of our study. Anna Cristina was married at age 15 to a man who brutalized her and her two daughters for years. She told us how when he would come home drunk and abusive, she'd have to escape over the wall in the backyard and sleep in the neighbor's patio to avoid the violence. He would tell her that she was completely worthless and nobody would ever care about her. And she believed him. She told her mother what was going on. And her mother said, this is what happens to every woman, and that she should just stay with it and keep her family together for the sake of the children. A few times she got up the courage to go to the police, and they sent her right home and told her to learn how to be a better wife. And every time she tried to leave, he would win her back with apologies, with flowers, with chocolates, and she would give in. Until one day, her grandmother urged her to leave. She sat her down and she said to her child, what are you gonna do with candies in hell? And her grandmother's support gave her the courage to leave her relationship and to leave the violence. So after telling this story, I don't want candies in hell became a rallying cry for the women's movement in Nicaragua. So now that we had the hard numbers, we were able to get the domestic violence law introduced into the National Assembly. But we didn't stop there. We published our findings in full page ads in the newspapers. And we encouraged women to tear them out, to sign them, and send them in to us demanding that their representatives pass the domestic violence law. Just over two weeks, we collected 16,000 signatures. And we went over to the National Assembly and we stuffed them in the representatives' mailboxes. And we reminded them that women made up half the electorate. And they were going to notice who voted for the law when the elections came around next time. So it wasn't a total surprise that a few weeks later, the domestic violence law passed unanimously in Nicaragua. Of course, the story didn't end there. In fact, it was just the beginning. But having a strong law saying that domestic violence was a crime was a really powerful statement that things were beginning to change in Nicaragua. And we weren't the only ones doing this kind of research. There were researchers and activists all over the world who were doing similar studies around this time to look at the prevalence of domestic violence and other forms of violence against women. And together with the World Health Organization, we carried out a landmark multi-country study on domestic violence and women's health, which showed the true magnitude of the problem throughout the world. And that is why we are able to say, with scientific precision, that one out of every three women will experience physical or sexual abuse by a partner in her lifetime. 
And that's not just in Nicaragua or in Africa. That's here. That's in our communities and maybe in our homes. As a result of these numbers and the hard work of the women's movement, violence against women is now at the very top of the international development, human rights, and public health agenda. So I've been really lucky in my life to be surrounded by many heroes and courageous people, starting with my father, Daniel Ellsberg, who risked 115 years of jail when he copied the Pentagon Papers and released them to the New York Times. At the time, Henry Kissinger called him the most, the most dangerous man in America. So you can see where my rebellious genes come from. <laughs> what I learned from my father is that courage is contagious. He was inspired to do what he did because he met some young draft resistors who were on their way to jail to protest the Vietnam War. And I have seen so many times in my work that one woman standing up and saying no to violence in her life can have a ripple effect that can transform communities. When we presented our results, one of the ways we did it was through this popular photo novella that community women could read and discuss together. And one day a friend of mine was at a police station and she saw a woman sitting there looking nervous, reading back and forth over through this, this, uh, this pamphlet. And she asked her what she was doing. And the woman said, I've been to this police station so many times to report my husband for all the beatings. And I always lose courage, and I always go home afterwards. But this time, I think I'm going to go through with it. I brought Anna Christina with me to give me courage, because I think if she could do it, if she could overcome the violence, then maybe I can too. When we were talking to women and asking them to, to tell us their stories about violence, one of the women spoke to us and said she really didn't understand why she should do this. It would be really painful to recall these experiences, and she really couldn't see what, what good it would do. And one of our interviewers, who was herself a survivor of violence, said to her, well, you're probably right. It's probably too late for you and me. But think about our daughters and our granddaughters. If you share your story, maybe, maybe things will be better for them, and they won't have to suffer the way we did. So this year, we're going back to Nicaragua to speak to the daughters and the granddaughters of the women that we interviewed 20 years ago to see what's changed since then. And we're particularly interested in understanding what kinds of programs and policies have been most effective in preventing violence against women. So one thing I've learned in all these years as a researcher is that numbers do matter, and they can make a difference. But the faces behind the numbers are just as important. And the next time you hear a really shocking statistic about violence against women or trafficking or child marriage, I invite you to remember the thousands of Anna Christinas who shared their pain so that we could know the truth of what was happening behind closed doors. And I invite us all to think, if they could conquer their fear and their shame to tell their stories, what can we do in our own lives to end violence against women? Thank you.